much for being here, for coming this <coughs> afternoon, especially as we celebrate our 50th anniversary here in New York. I'm Evans Hale, the executive director here, and we're so thrilled that you are choosing to be part of this and many more. We're, this is the first of a series of York Chats where we'll be discussing, having interesting people talking about the York, all we have done, all we're doing, and, and how it relates to theater in general. And this afternoon, we have a wonderful panel of people who will be answering and giving all sorts of stories and answering your questions as well. So to get us started, let me introduce Robin Haynes, who is the son of John Newton, a wonderful actor. <laughs> appeared on Broadway and all across the country. He's a director as well. Uh, Molly Gross, who is one of our wonderful board members. <laughs> Molly is our secretary. Molly goes back to the beginning of the company. Brindy Drosnes. Uh, who is also a, the first chairman of the board of the company, ladies and gentlemen. Woo! Yes, indeed. <laughs> Fran Soder, a noted director. Fran Soder, a director of Pac our Pacific Overtures. Anyone can listen to me. <laughs> Alex Demetria, who directed many things here as well. One of seven productions here at the York, including Lost in the Stars. <laughs> Charles Wright, ladies and gentlemen, who is writing the book on our 50th anniversary, a historian. <laughs> oh yeah, why don't you, Charles, why don't you get it? Why don't you split the? Why don't you split between the directors? They won't get in a fight that way. Uh, <laughs> no, Charles is writing this wonderful book that he'll be talking about, and he's, a, you know, as you as you may well know, he's also the co -pre, uh, co president of the Drama Desk. So we're especially thrilled to have him here. Joe DeMichael, who was our first managing director, as I recall, and stayed ready to come out. And of course, the gentleman who normally is out here giving a speech, I had to pay him off. Please welcome Jim Morgan. <laughs> So we're celebrating the 50th, <coughs> and you know it brings a lot of questions. And I think wait a minute, I have something to say. Yes. <laughs> what a surprise! <laughs> so you know, the, the, I'm going to just start this off, and then I'm going to hand it over to Charles to really kick it off, since Charles, you are writing the book on the theater. Um, but there are three words that, when I think of New York, uh, come to mind, and that is uh, produces, celebrates, and discovers. And, and you, those words apply to so many different things that the York does in terms of fostering new talent, uh, supporting great artists who come through here, uh, discovering great lost pieces that perhaps have not been seen in a while, and of course, creating new work. So that is part of what we're celebrating. And so Charles, I'm gonna turn it off you to take us back to, uh, take us back to the beginning. Well, the York actually had a long gestation and there were, um, sort of trial balloons floated at the Church of he the Heavenly Rest where the York uh, resided for almost 25 years. Um, the, um, but the, uh, the, the, the project really came together in the summer of 1968 when um, uh, Janet Hayes Walker and John Newton were uh, in the company of actors in Summerstock uh, in, uh, at Purdue University. And Janet had wanted to um, uh, have a theater company for a long time. She, Janet was in the original cast of um, Camelot on Broadway. And her friend Mary Sue Berry, who you may recall as the, the voice uh, who sings, the, the singer who, who uh, does Follow Me on the original cast album of Camelot. Uh, Janet and Mary Sue Berry became friends during the run of that show. And Mary Sue told, Mary Sue, whose name is now Mary Sue Hauk, told me that uh, she vividly remembered soon after she met Janet, Janet saying, I want to start a company um, I don't want to be in a company, just in a company. I want to be in charge of a company. <laughs> <laughs> so in the summer of 1969, Janet and John Newton, who had known each other for some time and had done summer stock elsewhere, um, met a guy named Stuart Howard, who was a graduate uh, in directing at Purdue. But he was a New Yorker and lived with his parents in New York, and they hit it off, the three of them hit it off, and uh, Janet and John invited uh, Stewart to join them in this enterprise. 
And so that was the beginning, the first, the real official beginning of the, uh, of, uh, the York Players, as it was called then, um, was January 22nd, 1969, two days after the inauguration of Richard Nixon. Um, the first production was The Battle of the Sexes, which was a series of scenes from uh, various uh, classical playwrights, um, and, <clears throat> and also Shakespeare, Congreve, uh, uh, Oscar Wilde, um, about love and romance, men and women. And um, it was uh, put together by Philip Burton, the uh, foster father of actor Richard Burton. And there's a story in that too because <laughs> Philip Burton and Janet knew each other from Camelot because when Moss Hart had a heart attack out of town, Philip Burton, foster father of the star of the show, Richard Burton, stepped in as a director. Wow. So on January 22nd, uh, 1969, the York began. And um, I'll turn this over to someone else to well, talk I, about I, I, Janet I, I, and about John. Well, I think that one of the best things is, especially this, is, this should be a freewheeling conversation. So any of you who have stories that you've since many of you were there, speak up. So, so yeah, Ro I mean, Robin, talk a little bit about especially your, and uh, you, were, you were barely born at the time, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I, when I think of the York, I think of three words, and they are Janet Hayes Walker. Right. Uh, I first met Janet in 1964. My dad, by the way, is John Newton, who's why Charles keeps looking at me whenever he mentions my dad. Um, Could I also say that one thing a number of people told me before <laughs> I met Robin was, you've got to listen to Robin Haynes. He sounds exactly like John Newton. <laughs> I, I told Charles earlier, when I first moved to town, I stayed with my dad for a while. And my mom would call and go, ah, God, which one of you is it? <laughs> we, were, we didn't really look that much alike, but we, we certainly did sound alike. Um, anyway, Janet, uh, my mom and dad, I grew up at a summer stock theater in Michigan called the Barn Theater, which is actually a barn. Um, and Janet came there in 1964 to do uh, My Fair Lady. And she and my dad did My Fair Lady, and they worked together f for the rest of Janet's life. And, uh, and she was absolutely a force to be reckoned with. It's a good thing. I, I'm not at all surprised to hear what you say about J what she wanted when she started th this company, because I, th I really think it's it's because of her that the company survived. I think any kind of theater company needs a driving personality like that, someone who's maybe a little crazy, yeah. um, <laughs> who will simply not let it die. And Janet was that person here. Well, let me ask you, yeah, was, I mean, Molly, yeah, go ahead. Uh, one of the things that, da that Janet was in the choir at the Church of the Heavenly Rest, and her husband, Charles Dosley Walker, was the director, and she uh, also sang in Canterbury, and one day she went to Canterbury and said, I'm starting a theater, and I need some help. <coughs> and so I said, gee, I love stage managing, but they don't love me to stage manage because I'm a woman. Sally <coughs> Smith, I was an alto. Sally Smith, a soprano, said, well, I love to do technical directing work, and I'm not allowed to do that because I'm a woman. So I said, that didn't stop Janet, so... <laughs> We can't, <laughs> and we were there, all right? That day, <laughs> Sally doing technical directing, I think I was house managing for a while, but I became stage manager. So. What were all the jobs that you handled over the years, Molly? Because you, you They kept changing the title. <laughs> she had more keys than anybody in the entire world. <laughs> yes, and I got in deep trouble because when we were doing tech week, I had keys and we were out of extension cords. I would go into people's offices and steal their extension cords. <laughs> and then occasionally I would forget to put them back. So Monday morning, there was always this call from the church, Molly. <laughs> <laughs> well, Brenda, yes, go ahead. I'm you were the, the something about Janet. She was one of the nicest people you could ever meet, but she did get whatever she wanted with a nice smile on her face. I'll give you one example, I'll give you two examples of it. One, um, one of our, actually the man who's the, um, I think he's the president of the board of directors now, right? David, David McCoy. Chairman right. of the board. Chairman. Da David McCoy. Chairman of the board. Chairman, right. Yeah. Uh, he said to her, we were, we were working, I'll describe this to you, we were working actually in a school gym and we used to have to build the set on the weekends and then take it down. and. Um, 
David came one day to Janet and said, uh, you know, these chairs are awfully uncomfortable. And with a very nice smile, she said to him, oh, well, will you, will you buy us some chairs for the theater? And he did. <laughs> <laughs> um, she said to me one day, you know, we don't, we never have had um, a board of directors or an advisory board or anything like that. And I kind of looked at her and knew what was coming next. <laughs> she said, would you consider forming one for us? And I, you know, say no to Janet. So I said, yeah, sure, I'd be glad to do that. And I got a lot of names, et cetera. And then the next thing I know was, well, will you be chairman of it? Yes, I'll be chairman of it. <laughs> But we worked in a school gym, and we literally had to, on the days that we were performing, which was the weekend, we had to put the set up from downstairs. We had to take chairs and build up the theater. I always used, I ran the box office for a while, and I used to say, have box office, we'll travel, because I would come up from downstairs with my little box and the tickets and the money, and, the, and that's how the theater was. It was not a theater as you know it but you wouldn't know once we had a production going. Well, let me ask a question, Charles, but you might be able to take, but anybody else as well. During this period, this is the late 60s, uh, you know, talk about just, give us some historic context on the resident theater movement in New York during that period anyway. I mean, what was going on? I mean, you obviously you had Broadway theaters and you had off-Broadway <coughs> scenes happening, but what was going on with the, with the new movement here in New York? Well, the um, resident theater movement, <clears throat> Regional theater is another term for it, though. Uh, people in the industry prefer resident theater because the theater is stationary and um, produces a season in one place. Um, it, that, that movement had been underway since the late 40s and early 50s. Margot Jones uh, of Texas was a, a leader in that. and. Um, uh, Zelda Fishhandler at uh, Arena Stage in Washington, D.C. Um, so when you talk about the regional theater movement, you generally think of Minneapolis or Seattle or Atlanta. But the fact is we have had a number of successful resident theaters here in New York. And at the, at the time that, that the York was uh, being established, there were others like the Manhattan Theater Club and the WPA, which were getting underway, the roundabout, roundabout down in, roundabout. The, uh, down in uh, Chelsea at that time. Mm -hmm. Was the number that started them that don't exist anymore? Many, yeah. yes. Many. Yeah. Well, I just want to go back to Janet for one second. One thing that hearing these stories reminded me about, the Heavenly Rest is an Episcopal church, uh, so there's a rector and, uh, well, there's a rector instead of a pastor. And um, very nice, there were two different ones <coughs> during the main years I was there, and um, it became known that Janet, or the combination of Janet and Molly together could talk the rector into anything. And there was a point where, and there were, sometimes we did shows in the sanctuary, uh, which was wonderful <coughs> and also daunting, but we did wonderful Shakespeare things. I remember the first thing I saw was uh, John taking over for the lead in uh, Gideon. Gideon. Whoever was playing the lead, it was the first show I had anything to do with, and John was on book, stepping in that night for this actor who was sick and couldn't continue. Not sick. His apartment building had gone on fire and he was running around screaming to everybody to get out. He was saving <coughs> lives oh. and he lost his voice. <laughs> I don't, I've never, if I knew that, I forgot. Anyway, so we do shows in the church and at some point someone in the church said, why are we doing another show in the church? I thought we had agreed there were gonna be a lot, many fewer productions in the church now. And the rector said, well, you know, I, Janet just sort of talked me into it. <laughs> so this rule was created where the rector's secretary had to be in the office with him whenever either Molly or Janet was there for a meeting. So he couldn't be talked into something by these very persuasive women. That's wonderful. Anyway. Well, what was, I mean, again, was there a particular mission other than obviously Janet wanted to run <coughs> a theater? Was there a program mission? Was there, yes. what was the, what did Janet want to do? What we did when I joined, which was about, I think uh, about 10 years after it started, because my daughter turned, was in one of our productions and turned 11, uh, we did two straight plays and two musicals a year. 
and the musicals were usually things that had not gone over well on Broadway or off Broadway. For instance, we did quite a few Sondheim things where he periodically would come backstage crying just a little because we did such a great job. But that's what the mission was. Mm -hmm. Am I correct? Janet's phrase for it was classics of all kinds. Mm -hmm. yeah. But they weren't doing musicals at all when I got involved. Right. And, and I then I found out that Janet had this incredible background in Broadway musicals and musicals in general, in music in mm -hmm. general. She had a master's degree in music from New England Conservatory and had studied with uh, Nadia Boulanger in Paris. Well, and uh, and I found out because I said, that. why aren't you doing musicals? And she said, well, they're just so difficult. And out of that came the idea that we would do one a year, and then it became two a year, and they began to get lots of attention. But now, what year did you start? Because they only got up to fourth grade over on that <laughs> side. <laughs> when did you I started in 1974, oh. and that was five was, years old. Because I was, I was six years old. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's where I was going to say the next step is is Jim. When did you, you know, a Florida boy come come up here, and how did you find the the York? Well, my aunt and uncle. <laughs> Mary and Pete Hamilton went to Heavenly Rest. And uh, after about three months up here, where various things I thought would pan out to, that would set my career on fire didn't happen, I said to my aunt, do you know any, anyone in theater that I could talk to? And she said, well, we really don't. But there is this dear little theater group at the church. Maybe you'd like to meet the woman who runs it. And that woman was Janet, and the church was Heavenly Rest, and it was York at five years old. And I just went, I came two years later. My first year was 1976. And the first show was uh, Eugene O'Neill's Touch of the Poet, mm -hmm. uh -huh. which Jim yeah. designed the set. Mm -hmm. um, I came, I graduated from school the previous spring. I went back to Seattle, I went to the University of Washington, I went back to Seattle, I worked at the Seattle Rep for two shows. Then came to New York, and I said to my dad, get me a job at York. <laughs> <laughs> and I started doing shows here immediately. I, I've always said nepotism is a wonderful thing. <laughs> and, <laughs> This place was phenomenal for me. I, I signed with agents and managers directly as a result of shows I did here. It was just a wonderful place to be and a wonderful group of people to be here with. It was, it was I said at the, at the, the kickoff thing, this, this always felt like family to me. Of course, my dad was one of the founding members. <laughs> but you know, Molly brought, brought snacks for rehearsals and uh, I still love raisins and peanuts more than anything else in the world. Um, and it just felt like a family effort. Strikes when yeah. we take the sets down at the end of a production. Janet and, and several other people always brought meals, meals for the actors. The actors all stayed to help take the sets down as opposed to saying, you know, I'm finished for the evening, goodbye. We had meals really between shows, too, and when between we did a matinee and evening, yeah. which we only did, I believe, on a Saturday. Or did we do it on Sunday, too? I think I Sunday think we, we finally had to give up because then. Uh, Upstairs, downstairs came on TV at night and nobody went to the theater. <laughs> <laughs> the influence of television. Well, go back to one thing you just, you all were saying, but I think that, well, kind of is only my lights going off in just my head now. So when you all were in production, you would have to take the sets down every night? Every week. Every week? Oh, no. Every, no, no, every, every night. Every, every, night. Every, the, the, every there, night. You want... <laughs> you talk. We had to, t if we, we performed on Tuesday and Wednesday because we couldn't perform on Monday and Thursday because the AAs had the room on Mondays and Thursdays. <laughs> yeah. So we'd put it up on Tuesday, take it down. Put it up on Wednesday, take it down. Make sure everything was away so that the kids from playing basketball wouldn't get hurt. The only way we could afford to do <laughs> that. Including the seats. Yeah, we had the seats and we put risers up. We were also a shelter for people uh, in, in, in need of housing from the city. So those beds were in the front of the church, and I paid the people who were on drugs to come in <laughs> and put up those chairs and put up those risers. That's true. Um, and I would that. just collect a whole lot of $5 bills, right. and then I would hand it to them. They had a community, and I found out that their leader was a guy <laughs> named Big Al. So I would tell Big Al when something disappeared, like one day our uh, toaster oven disappeared, and I told Big Al, and Lo and behold, the test of heaven came back. <laughs> <laughs> we not only had to take down the, the risers and the seat, we had to take down the stage. The, like, a, like a lot of school gyms, it had a little stage at one end, but it was small and far away. And so we put platforms in front of that, and those all had to come down every time. Right. So they could play basketball. Yeah, and that was the cafeteria too, wasn't it? Yes. It uh, was. The cafeteria was downstairs, in oh. the downstairs gym. Oh, but not it, yeah. it, 
eventually, after, well, maybe that was after we left. Because the kitchen was oh, right yeah. backstage. Was downstairs, it? downstairs. Uh, was <laughs> well, what was that that was right behind where we would cross? So speaking about basketball, I'm sorry. Uh, remembering Fran's production, uh, Pacific Overtures, oh. uh, they had just redone the gym to make it a multi-purpose room so it could be an amazing theater. Ha ha. And an amazing gym. <laughs> the gym part of it was very successful, and there were basketball hoops that were electric that came down uh, that were sort of either ignored or artfully disguised in the scenery. And, and they were worked by a switch backstage. And one night in the middle of Pacific Overtures, someone <laughs> leaned on the switch. And there were things draped <laughs> over we, yeah, we, had, we had ropes, we had or or hanging from them. The That's what, and, it, and it started coming down. And I, someone said, get the basketball hoop. And someone <laughs> ran backstage and undid the switch. And it stopped. And everything went off. But, uh, that was, sorry. Well, that's that's a a well, what was your first? What was your first? What was the first production you? My first had? show. Well, uh, uh, the first show I designed was Night Must Fall in oh, okay. March of '75, and uh, but I had just gotten involved there three or four months before. And Janet asked me to do, to do a poster. The first poster I did was the School for Wives, and uh, it just became uh, <laughs> I became the graphic designer and the set designer and. Um, it became my artistic home. And but the first uh, few months, you and I ran lights up in that thing. That that's was right. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Up, we. It was a ladder. We climbed yeah, we a ladder. Climb, yeah. climb ladder. And, and it was resistance kind of dimmers. Of that's right. dimmers. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Joe, when did you come on board? Uh, in 1992, 93. Oh, when we moved Yeah. Oh, it, just, it was until you went to the move over here. Well, yeah. It was just. It was the year. Carnival was the first. Was it the first? The, show? the Carnival was the first show that was done here in this yeah. space, according to the first yeah. musical. First musical. Was, right. Wasn't there a Barrett play that was done here first? Oh, a PJ Barrett. Play? Yeah. Uh, yeah, down by the ocean. Yeah. No, that was after. Oh, really? Was that yeah, because that, that was the next season. That was oh. the anniversary season. I did Carnival. I had a phone call from Michael Batari and Ron Case. I was. They did the. Yeah, I was in, the in between shows. There was a production of 42nd Street that closed, and um, Leo Meyer, who owned Atlas Scenic Studios, <coughs> would always say to me, if I wasn't working, put on a pair of tight jeans and come up and paint with me. So <laughs> I was at Atlas Scenic Studios. I got a telephone call from um, Michael Batari and Ron Case. They said, we're doing this show at a little theater in New York City. <laughs> they said, it's run by a woman, and you're usually pretty good with older women. <laughs> <laughs> They said, but there isn't a <coughs> stage manager, and, and we're not really sure what else is happening, but will you come and meet with, with, uh, with Janet, this woman that runs the theater? So I, I came down that night and met with Janet and Charlie, I think in the church, because they, they called, moved. Yeah. No, but they had called you that night, and then we met, and you took me on a tour down to the shop and walked around, and we talked a little bit. Um, and then they decided that I would stage manage the show. And as I started to ask about I who, fought them on it, but <laughs> <laughs> I, you know who else was involved, I realized there was, you know, there wasn't anybody who was building the set. And <clears throat> I'd never worked for the wages that the York was paying. Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> according, according to paying? according to uh, Jim, yeah. arguably, you might have been the first person to actually be on a. Salary. Well, me, I, not as the stage not manager. As the stage manager. As, as a stage manager, I was an I was an equity member, and it was still a showcase production. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But they were were going to rehearse at night, so I said, well, then maybe to make a little extra money during the day, I'll build the scenery, and I built the scenery during the day. We rehearsed at night. We put the show in here, like on a shoestring and with. Christmas lights from my parents' basement. Um, <laughs> and it won various awards. It, yeah, so it won the Outer Critics Circle Award for Best Musical. That's the first show Pam Hunt directed. Oh, well. Oh, well. Yeah. well let's, go we're back skipping before, let's go back to before yes. we moved to this space. Charles, what were some of the notable <coughs> notable productions back <coughs> the, that came from out of the other space? And so I think sort of the relationships that were first being built, like uh, when you did She Loves Me, uh, was that the first Sheldon Harnick? That was the first musical. 
Oh, is yeah. that right? Yeah. Yeah. I was. I played George in that. <laughs> Sheldon Harnett came to see it one night, and afterwards he came back to to say hi, and he said to me, oh, "This is one of my favorites." He said, I, "You know, I like you much better than Daniel Massey, who was the original." See, I never liked Daniel Massey very much. <laughs> I said, "Thank you, Mr. Harnick." And for uh, Charlie, uh, Charlie Walker. Uh, Janet's husband was the organist and choir master at Heavenly Rest right. and had music directed a lot of things for the Blue Hill Troupe mm -hmm. and various other theaters. He was very theatrically experienced. For whatever reason, he accompanied She Loves Me on an organ. They brought in, <laughs> they brought in a portable organ. Do you remember that? No. <laughs> yeah. I blotted it out. And, uh, Sheldon said to me later, I was so nervous meeting him. It was the first musical I'd ever designed anywhere. Sure. And uh, uh, I said, do you remember the set? He said, no, I remember that organ. <laughs> <laughs> well, but talk about some of those relationships. because I Well, you know, uh, early on, uh, a lot of the plays were what we would call classics. The first full-length play was Shaw's Candida with uh, Janet as uh, Candida Morrill and... Uh, uh, Mr. Newton as uh, the Reverend Morrill, um, and it, that was directed by Stuart Howard, the third of the founding triumvirate. But over the years, there were a lot of um, sort of um, epic shows, like The Ladies Not for Burning, and A Man for All Seasons, and Murder in the Cathedral twice, I believe. And some of those were done in the sanctuary, and there was a good bit of Shakespeare, Twelfth Night, a Midsummer Night's Dream, Romeo and Juliet. That was in the sanctuary as well. Yes, it was. And then after and Cyrano and Cyrano and de Bergerac. Did your yeah. father play Cyrano? He did. Um, and after um, She Loves Me, there were uh, there was a steady stream of underappreciated or nearly forgotten shows like The Golden Apple. Yeah. Um, the Janet was in originally. Yes. Uh, right on, on Broadway. Yeah. Um, and. Um, uh, the um, the apple tree mm -hmm. um, and um, 110 the, in the shade 110 in the shade which was the first Jones and Schmidt show uh, but let's save that for a second yeah. the um, the um, the grass harp right, right. Um, a, 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 a treasure that had had been um, if not forgotten then misplaced um, and um, a a pocket version of Little Me with seven actors, oh, seven wow. performers. Oh wow! Who put that? Do you know? Who put Jeff that? Moss. It was Jeff Moss's idea that he wanted to call it Very Little Me, but, they <laughs> <didn't know. laughs> but the idea was that the entire cast would change costumes as much as the lead guy did, mm -hmm. and it worked very well. Oh wow! And it almost moved to commercial production. Cycle well, one got very excited about it. When you you know you think about that and you think about all the York was doing at that period, what kind of attention was the York getting from the general public? I mean, at what mm -hmm. point did the general public or the critics start saying, "Wait a minute, there is this little theater company. It's on the Upper East Side, and, it's, and people are attracted to it, or, or is it, they're doing interesting productions." Was there something in particular, or was it just a growing well interest? The, the, it was stop and go. Um, for instance, with Anyone Can Whistle, the first Sondheim show, uh, which- Which Fran directed. Which Fran directed. Which Fran directed. That's, I want to ask oh, which My daughter was there. Yes, that's right. That's right. That's Rex right. Reed I came to see it, and he wrote a glowing review about it. Not only the work, the, 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 the text and the music, but also Fran's production. And so let me ask you, Fran, you have had a long relationship with Sondheim and a long, <coughs> long relationship with the York, and uh, you know, obviously Sondheim being a major part of that, what was it like, first of all, in terms of taking that show, and then also looking at reimagining it for obviously a, a much smaller space in a different way? Well, I had done the show at a theater where Jim and I had worked, uh, but it was in 76. I'd done a production of Anyone Can Whistle, and it's was kind of a, a like this stage with the audience out there. And it looked like everything that happened was lines of people. There was group A, group this, there was a parade. Uh, and when we started to do it, 
I suggested, and it was very ambitious. For, I, I did not know how things went up and down in, in, in the theater, <clears throat> but I suggested that we do it environmentally so that there was a little, the actual stage of the thing, and then there was a big runway, and then even underneath the balcony at the back of the theater, uh, there, was, there were more sets. And, uh, but I, I didn't think that, it, I, it just helped with the sense of lines and lines mm -hmm. and lines of people. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, mo Steve Sodom, had, I had worked on Sweeney Todd as Hal Prince's assistant. And um, after Sweeney opened, I was working uh, a real job, a day job. Um, something happened to Steve. He was in the hospital. We didn't know how serious it was. But they were putting the RCA libretto together. And I, the, nobody knew the script except I was next to Hal for all that time. So when Steve came home from the hospital, he strangely called me to come to his house on that, the Saturday after he came home. And uh, we had this conversation. He said, I'm going to tell you, I'm gonna tell you everything you need to do if you wanna have a career in the theater. And if you follow my career, if you follow my advice, you'll have a career in 10 years. Um, but in the course of all that, I, was whining that no one would hire me. I couldn't, nobody could find a place to work. And and not even Equity Library Theater. And everybody <laughs> said, we wanna see your work firsthand. Uh. So Steve said, well, do my work. <laughs> um, and I think specifically he said, do my stuff. And uh, anybody said, find a theater that's gonna do it really well, that could do the sets and the costumes and and uh, and I don't to this day I think God just guided me, uh, but I had come because I, I, there were not a lot of theaters off off Broadway that did musicals and that did them with uh, really threadbare budgets, and I went into the church and I saw Golden Apple and then I'll shut up, uh, but I I. The show was beautiful. It was just beautiful, handsome, costumed, performed, sets, lights, and uh, so. And I had a. I was one of those directors. I had never done Rodgers and Hammerstein. I had never done. I was from Cleveland. I had done sixty shows in Cleveland, but I'd never done Cole Porter. I had done The Grass Harp. I had done Any Winkle Whistle. I had done most of Sondheim. Al Carmine, Cryer, and Ford. Mm -hmm. And I went up to Janet, and, and I, I figured out who she was. <laughs> and I went up to Janet, and I said, my name's Fran Soder, I'm from Cleveland, and I have the rights to do Stephen Sondheim, and I would like to work for you. And that was how it happened. What, what, what was the reaction, I mean, what was her reaction, I mean, at this point, I mean, certainly well, she. Well, I, I, she was, she was so beautiful, and she she had literally, you know, blue eyeshadow and red lipstick. She 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 um, was like the Donna McKechnie of her time, and uh, I uh, and I got back to Stephen. I said, you know, I found a theater, and I can guarantee you this is going to be beautiful, and so that's how it happened, and. Uh, now, how did any, anyone can whistle? It was, I mean, was that something because you had wanted to do it, or is it something that he had wanted to see done and re, rethought? I, I wanted to do it, because I thought, this show I will get noticed on, because it's a crazy, crazy show, and it's a, uh, a crazy show. And um, so to make a long story short, uh, Steve may, introduced me, or. I had to meet Arthur Lawrence, who had the general, he was the director and the book writer. So I had to get his approval, and he approved it. 
And uh, what I didn't know at the time was that Arthur and Steve were very professional, but they were not friendly at this point in their life. And Arthur would come one night and Steve would come one night and I didn't know this, but the night of our final tech, uh, the set wasn't quite done yet. The cast <laughs> were, <laughs> and uh, uh, we went till 2.30 in the morning and there were all these little <clears throat> middle school girls, you know, working at two o'clock, one o'clock at night. And- Brandy's daughter, Carrie. Yeah, yeah. she was, was baby Joe. She was 11. Yeah. And so we finished and I looked to Steve, it was 2.30 and I looked to Steve and I said, well, do you have any notes? And Steve was like, I'm embarrassed at the writing. Oh. Now, Whistle was not a hit show. No. It lasted a couple weeks, if, I, if that. And Steve said, and I think he met him, Arthur as well as he, um, it was a very experimental show. And he said, does it have to be so angry? And I said, Steve, it's an angry show. <laughs> you know, it's about McCarthyism. And, and, and religion and, and anybody being different. Uh, and so he looked at me and he said, well, let's just do one thing. At the very end of the first act, there came a moment where an actor on stage said, you are all mad. And suddenly theater lights appeared and the cast appeared as the audience. And they were doing like uh, Warner Brothers Looney Tunes. Oh, 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 they're pointing and laughing. And, and uh, Three Stooges sound effects. And uh, Steve said, can you just make that moment, tell the cast tomorrow night that they've just seen the most wonderful show and to really applaud it and love it and not mock it. Did you know this? Yeah. <coughs> and I thought, I'll never see Steve again. <laughs> and then next thing I knew, Janet called me and said, I called Steve and we've got the rights to a little night music. And these were both the first, the very first. I was gonna say to get the New rights York to do those shows in New York that soon after they had been done. Mm -hmm. And Jim, didn't you say that York has the distinction of having done more Sondheim shows in the, in the New York? Yes, movie? we still actually hold the record. <coughs> Roundabout is this close to passing us because we, we don't regularly do Sondheim anymore because it doesn't exactly fit in with what we do. But uh, when we did Saturday Night four years ago in the Mufti series, uh, that kept us up <laughs> roundabout. So we'll have to find another one. <laughs> and could I just um, yeah. in, uh, say that uh, Rex Reed, uh, writing in the Daily News on March 19, 1980, wrote, the York Players, a poor but distinguished theater company in the Church of the Heavenly Rest, is not Broadway, but I cannot imagine a more spirited revival of Anyone Can Whistle than the one being presented there. Having already applauded this remarkable group's productions of the Golden Apple and the Grass Harp, I was eager to see what they'd do with such an ambitious project. I wasn't disappointed. And he went on to praise Fran in particular and Gailey Byrne as, um, as the mayor. Well, that's, that's wonderful. So Alex, yeah. Now you have done, I mean, uh, again, a number of seven productions here. Yeah, about seven. And uh, a, a various, and how many? Uh, obviously, all notable. But Lost in the Stars is, of course, one of the landmark productions that was done uh, uh, that I knew about long before. Well, I guess I've known Jim for many years, but before I really got involved with the York. Talk a little bit about. And that's another really interesting project that that had to have been one of the early. Bibles of uh, I think so. I, I started, I think it's 1985 is my first show, uh, which was Home by David Story. Oh. Uh, and through the years, I did mainly uh, st straight plays. I, uh, Alan Akeborn, How the Other Half Loves, uh, <coughs> Taking Steps. Oh, nice. um, so uh, an opportunity, can, I, don't, I cannot remember how it came about. Or I might have suggested, or but Lost in the Stars, which is a pretty it was a pretty ambitious thing because again, if you to understand, if this was an empty room and none of this was here, 
we would have to set this all up for you every night and, and it's so that you have a, a sense of that. So Lost in the Stars, we had a, a cast of 22 and a 13 piece orchestra. Uh, and so you had a little proscenium at the back of the basketball court and you, we put the orchestra there and then we build out a four stage in front of that. And uh, we did it somewhat, again, because of the logistics of the space and knowing that everything had to collapse and disappear uh, after practically every performance. Uh, we b basically built uh, <coughs> like risers on the set on either side and did it sort of Brechtian. So the, the center area was the playing area and actors came on stage from there uh, and did the show and then went back off to the side when they weren't in the scene. And uh, what was interesting, and I talked about this once before, is uh, this all happened uh, at the time of the, uh, the preppy murder case. Uh, uh, Robert Chambers. Yes. Uh, and he lived, his mother lived right across the street from the Heavenly Rest. And so the, the story, of, of course, of, of Lost in the Stars is the, the son is involved in a, in a robbery and a murder and he's being tried and convicted and going to be sentenced to death. And uh, during our performances, during the kind of culminating scenes of a particular night, we would be hearing out on the street, across the street from the Chamber's house, chants of murderer, murderer, <laughs> murderer, murderer. When there was like life and art coming together uh, in, in New York <coughs> City. Uh, good show, wonderful cast. Uh, it was nominated for uh, Best Revival of a Musical that year for a Drama Desk Award. It was, uh, and it was, Essentially, I think the only musical I've done. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, for the York. Oh, uh, oh for the York. Uh, yeah, uh, because I've d I've done a Mufti, uh, but mainly I was the, the straight guy. <laughs> <laughs> you had Every a very theater large orchestra because of the estate. Yeah, we had to have we we had to use a thirteen piece orchestra because they would uh, the Kurt Vile estate yeah. wouldn't allow us to change the arrangement of it. So. Uh, that it was was, Lin, was Linia al still alive then? Alinia with Lottie? I, I, yeah. I'm not sure. No, she, she passed away. Yeah. yeah. But the way we afforded it was, they were students from Manhattan School. Yeah. Um, which Very we can do Hill. now because we have an agreement with the musicians. Yeah. Junior. Yeah. So that'll never happen again. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> again, back in those days, I mean, the most, uh, I think we, we, we got 500 bucks for eight weeks' work. Essentially, wow. Car fare, or, or so you have, and it's uh, that was the wonderful thing about the York, is that they were doing shows that n you couldn't do, and you could do them at under the showcase code with that five hundred dollars, and we would rehearse at night. You would rehearse whenever you could get the actors because a lot of them had day jobs or some night job, <coughs> so. Uh, when, uh, what I learned in terms of, of is you, when you go into casting, you, you have like three choices for every role <coughs> because you know at some point someone's gonna leave for a better job and so you're going, okay, that one's gone, go to the next one because uh, just the economics of it under the code, if an actor got a better job, they could leave. Uh, so I've lost actors tech night uh, and you just, you know, you have, your backups ready to go as much as you can. Uh, it was an interesting time because everything was not fly by night, but on the wing, you know, you're on the wing constantly uh, and setting up, putting down, taking the, and it was a great <coughs> focus of energy to do it mm -hmm. by everyone involved. And that was the- That the, was the beauty of it. Everybody yeah. got involved. Everyone was there. <laughs> to get the show was, up and there on. There was no actor who would say, I don't, I don't do the sets or I don't take something down afterwards, I just do the acting. Well, Nobody I, did that. I, what you mentioned, I mean, we were all young and hungry and trying to break into the business. 
and it was a showcase for us. And the whole idea of the showcase code was you didn't get paid in money, you got paid in showcase. Mm -hmm. then, and uh, you know, people from the industry would come to see the show. And as I said, I, I signed with an agent and with a manager directly as a result of doing the show. Stuart Howard, we did Romeo and Juliet in the church. Uh, Tim Landfield played Mal uh, Mercutio. Right. And he was signed, his manager, Lois Zetter, came to see the show. And Stuart Howard sat behind her all night whispering in her ear, what about Robin? What do you think about Robin? <laughs> and finally she turned around and said, all right, have him call me. <laughs> and I did, and she was my manager for years. When did, St when did Stuart become a casting, uh, a casting director? Because I've, I've known Stuart for years, but only as a casting agent. And, and well, and because he was he an actor? I mean, was he when he when he started? He started as an actor, right? Well, he Dan and Janet met him and John and Janet in um, some the show at, at the, Purdue. At, at Purdue, yeah. out on the wall. Of the well, I saw them do um, uh, Pinter's uh, the birthday party. But by the time I got here in the mid-70s, Stewart was casting at Ogilvy and Mather mm -hmm. right. for commercials. Just so you know, Stewart Howard, who was one of the founding members, is one of the leading casting agents in New York and has been so for many years. And he would have been here today, except that he's casting a film in Canada and said, he, you know, with much apology, he said, I cannot, I've tried every way I can to get away from there and I just can't. So, but, so, so he's a major career there. And I, I should mention other people who yeah. are not here. David McCoy, the longtime chairman of our board, is in Florida. He, he got involved in croquet, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, because he thought he might meet rich people there who would support the York. <laughs> <laughs> and within three years, it became a nationally ranked croquet player. <laughs> this just shows both his dedication and his uh, amazing talents in various areas, and so anyway, he has a croquet tournament tonight in <laughs> West Palm Beach. Let, let me let me jump in. You all don't understand how serious this is. He was taking me a tour in Palm Beach of the set, and it, so we were knocking some balls around, and I had a ball that was right in the middle of the wicket, and he said, "Oh, I'll take care of that." And he knocked his ball over mine through the wicket onto the other side, and didn't move mine at all. So so he he's yes he's quite the expert. On it. <laughs> <laughs> so, and who else? Susan uh, Shulman was Susan, Susan, Susan Shulman, who directed a number of shows for us as well, uh, is also the head of theater at uh, Penn State and had an emergency. She had to be there today, otherwise she would have been here. But uh, and Pam Hunt, Hunt, who's directed a number of things for us, uh, is directing a show out in Indiana or somewhere yeah. and couldn't Scott, get here. So. Scott Ellis. Uh, Scott. What? Scott Ellis became quite known as a director. Yes, I've heard the name. <laughs> <laughs> what, Charles, while we're talking about, what are some of the relationships, you know, going back and Jim as well, you know, talking about like Sheldon Harnick starting back. Wait, just one second. No, sorry, she sure. mentioned Scott Ellis. Yes. Scott played Jimmy in Fran's production of 110 in the Shade, and he played Puck in uh, uh, Midsummer Night's Dream and broke his leg, yes, or arm, broke his something, his broke leg. something. Leg. But he went on with the show. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And he was either flying he was down. dedicated or stupid. He yeah. was flying down, I think, from the balcony in the church. That's right. That's right. It's yes. the third floor windows, and the, uh, he just didn't hold on the rope yeah. as long. Well. Wait, wait, go back. No, no, that, you can't just jump over the seat. So he was flying <coughs> down from the balcony of the church. He, he was no, on, not, uh, it's, it's, it's a row of windows that is over the choir stalls, which actually lead to the church offices, which is why I had a key to everything, so that I could slip this guy mm -hmm. out the window of the rector's office. Nice. <laughs> and was he on a cable? Was I think so. <laughs> I think there should have been that. that uh, uh, Sally, Sally that. Smith did it. Yes. <laughs> So, anyway, so go back to yeah, no, no, no. So, sure. I mean, but again, one of the things that New York it makes New York so special are these relationships that, that that bring a sense of continuity of these major people who have come through or become major artists in in having their careers and going back to some of the creators like well, Sheldon. Going back to right. The, well, there there are people who got their essentially got their starts here. Um, <coughs> I don't know, who Molly. Um, uh, Jane Glenn, Krakowski. Jane Krakowski. Glenn Close Scott worked here. Crane. Scott Ellis, you mentioned. But there are also people that. David Crane. David Crane. But there oh, are people say to me all the time, my first show was at the York. Mm -hmm. And I right. said, well, why don't you 
write it up and put it on our website for our 50th anniversary. Uh, Rachel Lemansky. Yes, who became? Rachel York. Yes, right. No. right. She was in Imagine the, if she had worked at the roundabout. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she was in uh, Lost in the Stars. That's right. And uh, I think she changed her name based on her experience. Well, she later on, she came back and did something with us. And I said, so now did you change your name because you were at the York? And she said, well, and there, there were, there were uh, uh, different sides to the story. There was a family history to the name York, but also she said, I felt very fondly, so I think it sort of pushed me in that direction. But no, you cannot say that I chose my name because I was at the York. <laughs> so we've never published that. Uh, but you can put it in the book. I can put it in the book. <laughs> well, um, you know, there are also people, established people in the theater who got involved. For instance- Merle Louise. That's right. Oh, that's a good example. She's yeah. in the original cast of Company and Sweeney Todd. And, Sweeney Todd. and uh, Lacage. And Lacage, that's yeah. right. And she had been at Purdue with yeah. Janet and John. Yeah, that's right. And Tammy Grimes. Tammy. Tammy. She well, uh, she, didn't, she didn't start with us. She, so Frank, yeah, but Frank Langella. We, we had a nice uh, time with her <laughs> yeah. later in her career. But yeah. yeah. No, I, don't, I wasn't saying she started, but oh, she was, oh, very, yeah, she was yeah. very happy to work yeah. Oh, yeah, with the York. Yeah. <clears throat> and I think had an argument with her agent, said, I'm he doing it. Yes. <laughs> and what did and also oh, Frank, Langella was, Frank Langella was? Frank Langella did uh, Booth. Booth, oh, right. right. By Austin yeah. Pendleton. But, you know, Janet and others had uh, relationships with and acquaintances <clears throat> with people in the, in the theater. Um, at the end of his life, George Abbott um, uh, uh, yeah. directed and uh, his uh, musical um, Frankie, Frankie. His, his version right. of Frankenstein. Um, at one point, I think Jim found a copy of The Wisteria Trees in a bookshop, in a, in a used bookshop. Which is Josh Logan's version of The Cherry Orchard set in the American South at the time of the Civil War. And I thought, this is fascinating. This, and I, thought, I immediately thought of Janet playing the lead and uh, it ended up, she didn't play the lead, uh, but it was a very good production. It got a lot of attention. And, and, and um, I think, Jim, you went to the Logan's apartment. Yeah, in the uh, River House. And to he, borrow furniture. I did a drawing of, of, it takes place in, a, in an antebellum plantation salon. And I said, well, this is what the architecture would look like. I don't know where we're gonna get this furniture. And he said, well, why don't you come to my apartment? And <laughs> <laughs> so I went over to their apartment in the River House. And he said, you take anything you want. Uh, Josh so Logan, of course, was the author of Mr. Roberts and the libretto of South Pacific and a great, very great director. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, so we took an armoire and we took two or three chairs and uh, a rug and rolled it all up and put it in a van or something. And, and, and Janet snagged him for the honorary uh, board. Yes, that's so, right. Uh, uh, well, along with Celeste Holm, for instance. And, right. uh, Let's yeah. jump ahead a little bit to when you actually, uh, well, two things. The first, Oscar Hammerstein Award, and some of the other things that the York is very well known for. Uh, but the, the first Oscar Hammerstein Award, how did that even come about? Because uh, that is one of the great New York events every year. Uh, there was a, a woman on the board at the time, Helen Lee Henderson. I believe it was actually her idea. It was. And, and that was the uh, 20th anniversary of the company. That's right. 1989. 1989. She was June, the one who suggested yeah. that. Yeah. And um, uh, Janet said, well, I think Steve Sondheim should get the first one. And uh, so everyone thought that was a great idea. And so she wrote Steve a letter, and he, he wrote back. I will accept the award, but I can't help but feel the chill wind of exploitation. <laughs> <laughs> well, but how did, I mean, it did... And then he was out of town when the award happened, so Angela Lansbury accepted it. For, oh, wow, well, so, so he did, he never even, he, he was not there the evening of, yeah. the, of the actual award. But how did, I mean, did, was it something, did you all approach? Because now, of course, the award is very closely associated with Ted Chapin, R&H, &R and yeah. the office itself. But back, yes. but back to Mr. Sondheim for a minute. Yeah. He has been wonderfully supportive of the award through the years. I don't know that he's ever actually been to one of the- <laughs> Oh, I know that he uh, has. He was at the one for, for Arthur Hal Lawrence. And for Hal Prince. Hal Prince. No, he wasn't at the one for Arthur Lawrence. He was out of town and he taped something oh. at 
some ad agency right near here. He said, I'm sorry, I'm going to be out of town, but can I do a video? So he was at one that I attended, though. Uh, there was a problem with the ticketing, and um, this was at the church here. Yeah. And um, a certain number of ticket holders were stuck at the ticket desk, and my wife and I were standing right next to him. And um, I thought, gee, I wouldn't want to keep um, Stephen Sondheim waiting. But he was very, very patient and courteous about it. So how uh, did, I mean, but how, what would, I mean, when, who said, hey, let's do Oscar Hammerstein as opposed to somebody else? Well, I, mean, I think the whole idea was uh, that we needed, an, we always need money, but we need a regular income stream that could be counted on at a certain point every year and also build our uh, visibility mm -hmm. and uh, uh, sort of celebrate the kind of people that we um, um, believed in and whose work that we do. So the fact that it, it's interesting that it's celebrating lifetime achievement in musical theater before we had gone to an all musical format. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of the thing that when I went in that direction, right. I just thought this supports this idea. Uh, but it's done a lot for us in terms of visibility, and, and as you say, it gets a lot of attention. No, it's one, it's one of the great New York and fall events, and, and I mean, and, and again, I mean, but why Oscar Hammer? I mean, who said, "Hey, let's name it after Oscar Hammerstein"? I think it was Helen she Henderson. Did. Yeah, she did. Yeah. Well, because yeah. it's such a well-known. Sure, of course. Name. And and there were already Rogers Awards, um, yeah. mm -hmm. various other awards, and I don't think there was a. Oscar Hammerstein. Did she know the Hammerstein family? Not to my knowledge, no. So talk about the move over here and the change over and why from the church, which had been the home for 20 years plus, to to uh, to to the York, to now, to well, You were very City involved Bay. in that. You, you created the staff, you created the office. You <coughs> did all of that. I did. So talk. So <laughs> tell us about it. Well, we, um, I mean, to hear the, the artistic side of it is fascinating because I hadn't really heard about, hadn't really known about York until um, the Sweeney Todd production. Like I was friendly with Eddie Corbett and I knew Eddie was in the show. It was Susan Schoen. <coughs> right. That was 1989 and that production was very well received and moved a oh. year later to the, um, the, to the, the Circle, Circle in the Square, square Midtown. Known as Teeny Todd. It was, yes. it was the first revival. Right. And that was after, uh, but going just without getting too yeah. much on tangent, the Pacific Overtures, which had been done at the church, right? Right, at the other church. At the, the, uh, the other church? Oh, oh that's right, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Right, at the other, other church, yes. <coughs> but, then, uh, but then had moved to the promenade. Which is Fran's production. Right, exactly. That was Fran, yeah. that was, you know, without getting too much, but t talk a little bit about, again, reimagining this mammoth show to a, to a smaller... Well, I, I I had done, Janet had this way of always appearing in when I was doing something somewhere. And I had I had decided at Kane Park that I wanted to do Pacific Overtures because I'd never get a chance to direct it if I didn't do it at uh, my summer theater where <coughs> I got to pick the show. And uh, um, we did a very elaborate production of it. Uh, and the costumes were pretty, if there's, there's uh, over a hundred costumes in the show. And uh, um, Janet showed up once at a, at a performance and she said, we're going to do Pacific Overtures next year. And I said, oh no, we're not. And she goes, oh yes, dear. Uh, we've already gotten a grant from <coughs> Citibank and we're renting the costumes and the props from our production in Cleveland. <coughs> but the magic thing about that production was Jim had one of the joys of York. Every show was beautiful. And one of the magical things about Jim was that he was able to miniaturize, you know, and where something would be an elaborate, let's say in Pacific, Pacific Ocean, there would be a whole room would come rolling down the stage. And, and what Jim would do is, uh, if you look at the lip of this stage, he would pull out a bamboo 
a little map of bamboo and a stagehand would place a little flower in front of a window, you know. And Jim miniaturized, um, I mean, night music was done as a chamber musical in an upholstered room. And my concept was the whole show would be through the eyes of the little girl that was Jane Krakowski. And together we came up with the idea, well, this is through, she's the only one who hasn't made a mistake uh, on the stage. And we created a turntable upstage that was a toy city. And half, half the upstage side of the turntable was trees and the other side. So when Desiree would be sitting in a train, in a train car talking about her travels, the little turntable would move around so you could see going from city <laughs> to country to city. And then in the second act, uh, Madame Armfeldt's mansion, a dollhouse. I mean, it was not a doll dollhouse. It was a pretty big piece of work. But there, Jim had this way, and uh, the Pacific Overtures I did include them would have never worked. Um, but Jim miniaturized it in such a way that it, it was, it, they moved it. I mean, the, I, I remember I had this, it, it's, a, it's a great Janet story, but I had this terrible day, and I had decided that Pacific Overtures was gonna be the end of the theater for me. I was either gonna, I was gonna leave New York, go back, and I screamed, you know, um, the agent that I've been trying to get for every show at York had called, his assistant called and said, I can't be there. And, and I just was outrageous and almost in tears. And my phone rang, and it was Janet. And she said, Fran, dear, uh, what are you doing? And I said, I'm about, to commit, I'm about to commit suicide. <laughs> she said, just run out <coughs> and get the papers. So I came back with the papers, and I had the Times, the Post, Newsday, Daily News, and uh, my phone rang, and it was the actual agent whose assistant had called to say that he could not be there. And then the phone rang again, and I said, Janet, I, I need two tickets for tonight <laughs> for Clifford Stevens. And she said, well, Fran, I, I need 12 tickets tonight, the Schubert organization <laughs> is coming. And I hadn't even read the reviews yet, but they, it was a life altering moment. But it, but the, I'll shut up, but the shows at York were always, be, they were always beautiful. It looked, it did not look like an off, off Broadway theater company. And we didn't always pare down the cast. I mean, there were 19 people in Pacific Overtures. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, but one, and one, of the, one last thing I want to say about Janet, she was a nurturer, you know. Uh, she made you feel so special right. in whatever you did. Right. She, she just loved you and, uh, and stood behind you like 100%. And that is the, I'm writing a book, eventually I'll have it done, but my concept of surviving in the theater uh, is that you've got to have a producer, somebody that nurtures, leaves you alone to create, even if you make a mistake. And Janet was the very first nurturer that I had. And boy, I tell you, when you do theater and you don't have somebody like that, somebody who's nervous and nasty, it, it affects everything. Another thing about Janet was I would sit in periodically uh, for the auditions, which of course every actor is very nervous about. And even when she didn't accept someone, she always called them over, said something nice about something. So they, they always walked out feeling okay, that they hadn't been rejected, you know, they hadn't been taken seriously. And she just made that a point to talk to everybody who came and auditioned for the show, and it was just a wonderful trait. The other thing Jim did for Pacific Overtures, what was the um, Japanese thing, the Hama, Hama something or other? Hanamichi. Yeah, which everyone said, uh, that you can't put it, it's, it's 
describe what it is. <laughs> Everybody said they Talk about your set that. For, for that show, because it really was story it was extraordinary. Did we right. have it at York? Did we have, yes. We did it. Yes. We did? Yes. <laughs> it's a ceremonial <laughs> ramp that yes. a lot of Don't important things Francis, happen Francis on. Francis Chu running down that to get to the tree. We're, we were scared. We I remember that at, at uh, the promenade. When it moved. We were scared we wouldn't be able to get the, the Hanamichi into the promenade. Right. Well, that might right. Be, you got it into your work. Yeah, well, they, they, and you also had the rickshaw, That's which right. we didn't have That's the promenade. Right. That's right. <laughs> well, talk about now that, I mean, let's talk about the move to here. I mean, how that came about and why. Let me just mention yeah. to everyone, you have a bottle of water by your yeah. chair. <clears throat> Before we go on, I want to kind of expand the, I mean, something Brindy said. That the thing about Janet was that she'd been there. She'd been a, a kid in New York and broken into the theater and she had auditioned and had, had tough times. And she, she was in the original cast of The Music Man. And she had a call back in the theater like the first day of rehearsal. And they came down to her and another girl. And they both sang and they both read. And then they said, thank you, Janet. We're, we're going you know, to go with whoever. And she left and she was walking down the street. And an assistant stage manager came running out going, Jan Janet, wait, stop, no, come back, come back. And, and they, she went back and they said, no, we, we made a mistake, we, we want you. Uh, so she had been through all of this stuff and she knew what it was like to be a young actor and to audition. And she was, my understanding, my, my dad was a great guy and pretty casual. So his story about the, the origin of York was, well, you know, Stuart and Molly and I each pitched in 25 bucks because we wanted a place where we could do shows. <laughs> And so we just did shows we wanted to do. That was the mission as far as he was concerned. Um, but so Janet nurtured because it was exactly what she wanted. She just wanted a place where people could do shows and she wanted people to come in who were passionate about it and wanted to do shows and she loved that. And she, she was quite a figure. You may have gathered we all have a certain amount of respect for her. Yeah, I would just like to say uh, Mary Jo Donglinger who uh, is a uh, uh, a lighting. distinguished lighting designer and who designed shows, uh, lighting design for shows at the York for many years. And she did it in the Sipco, which yes. was Sweeney Todd. And she said to me, we were, we were all there out of love. Love for the theater and love for Janet. That's right. That's right. Yeah. 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 How did we get here? So let's go to here now. <laughs> so, uh, well, uh, it, I guess it happened after Carnival. I, I don't actually know if... Well, so now, according to Charles, this Carnival was the first musical done in this space. Right. Right, okay. Yeah. Right. But it was the next season that the York took over the space. Oh, so in other words, Carnival was done as kind of an independent, just a... Right, there, there was a show? A, there, there was a... There was a season where we did shows both places, which <coughs> confused everyone. Mm -hmm. And people would arrive at one theater with their tickets, and they'd say, I'm sorry, it's at the other place. Right. I don't know why that was decided. I, yeah, that was the year that you did Carnival. And then yeah. when in the next season, when all of the shows were done here, that was the anniversary season. Right. That was the PJ's. The 25th. Right. PJ's um, Down by the Ocean, right. Booth, and Merrill. Right. Right. Well, right. Wasn't was it Booth done at Asphalt Green? No, it was here. Oh, Booth was here. Really? Booth oh, was yes, here. yes, yes. But yes. when was How the Other Half Loves? Was that the next After year? the next that season. Was here. Yeah. Uh, was the next season. That. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I can tell a story about how we <coughs> ended up here. Mm -hmm. Because we were at Heavenly Rest, we were actually, when we were at Heavenly Rest, we were actually part of that organization because Janet and Charlie were both. Well, Charlie was the choir master, and uh, so York became an arm of it. And there were people who wouldn't give money to us because it was a religious organization. And I think that set us back in terms of development in the early years. We didn't have to pay any rent to the But church. that's the other thing. We didn't have any rent. We, we started at the same time as Roundabout and Manhattan Theater Club. All of us who worked in those places used to meet Roundabout and Manhattan Theater. They all had directors of development. We did not. Right. Because we didn't need one. We yes. Didn't, we didn't have our own 501c3. And Joe Stockdale kept saying, you've got to grow up, guys. You've got to grow up. Yeah. Uh, Joe Stockdale is... Uh, was a director from Purdue. That's he directed all of those folks at Purdue and directed a number of things for us, including uh, didn't he do the uh, Eugene O'Neill, uh, Touch of the Poet? No, Janet did. 
Oh, Janet did that. But she was also in it. Yes, yeah, she right. was. Yeah. Anyway, um, so we were part of Heavenly Rest, so we didn't have to have our own board of directors. We had an advisory board. So um, it wasn't until we moved down here that we had to get our own 501c3 and become a fully functioning not-for-profit on our own, and it took a while. But uh, <laughs> Janet found out this space was available. The uh, musical theater works had been here for like two years and couldn't make a go of it. They were leaving, Janet found out it was available, and she came and met with the board and said, well, St. Peter's Theater is available, and I think we should move there. And I, for one, have been saying, we've got to get out of here. This is just because the day school that I worked for was, uh, it was very difficult uh, logistically making everything happen in that space, even though it was free. And Janet said, I think we should move to St. Peter's. And the board said, we don't think that's a good idea. And she said, sorry, I signed the contract. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I had found someone to pay for it for the first two years, a foundation. And if we had had a functioning board of directors, if we had had to have a functioning board of directors, we would not be here today. We might not even be here today. <laughs> but uh, because we didn't, she just took it on her own to find this place. And it's because of Janet that we're in this space. And that was 1993. 1992 is when we moved here, so uh -huh. maybe that was 91. I don't know. But, but anyway, so but, then Joe came on board. Right, but you did have an angel then, right? There, yeah, Scott McLucas. Scott McLucas. And his right. foundation, the One World Foundation. Exactly. Paid for the first two years of the rent. Right, but what I think what he had agreed to do was he would pay for half of the rent. <laughs> and Janet was looking for somebody to pay oh, for I the other half uh, of the rent. And that's why, why, you, why in that first season, you didn't have all of the space down here because the other theater company that was working in here which I, I can't was remember. Was that the Mirrorette? No, no they the were was, No, oh. it was um, it was like it was the St. Bart's Players. Ah. Oh, I thought we made that agreement ourselves just to help support the space. No, they were paying half of the rent. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah we said, will you come in with us on this? Right. It was our agreement with them to help us pay for the space. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then, yeah. then we were looking for somebody else in that next year to come, to come in. But we didn't really find anyone. We talked to, Janet and I talked to Signature Theater, and we talked to two or three other theater companies to try to get them to come in and be in the space with us, and we didn't. So we said, well, we'll just make it work. Um, I think it was you know, sort of by accident and ready. There was enough success that it was time to scale up, and um, it just happened then. Um, you know, we, we started to build, um, uh, that sort of that back office from for a theater company. Mm. I remember um, <clears throat> early on we um, asked uh, uh, you know Janet Charles you know to say you know we would we would start paying some of the bills um, that year that I was a production manager. Right. Um, I was I was the only employee that year. Oh wow! Um, <laughs> and I stayed on on through the whole the, through the whole year. And we started to very slowly take the little bits and pieces of work that um, Janet and Charlie were doing out of the you know, bedroom in their home and try to bring them down here. We built an office, we put a telephone system in. Uh, when, when we first came down, um, you would have to call and leave a message right on, a, on an answering machine and somebody would call you back so that you could buy your ticket to see the show. Um, and we put multiple phone lines in, um, and and we did that whole anniversary season, um, and there were some successes there. Um, uh, I mean, I think it was it it was nice to have Frank Langella here right, until he broke his ankle. And do you remember that? Mm -hmm. no. Yeah, <laughs> it was a show in the winter. I've forgotten all the broken bones. And oh, <laughs> yes, yes. I think chasing Elton so, Barkin down the snow. So that's places. 1903. And so, Jim, shortly <coughs> thereafter, I mean, the, you know, there's a, tra there's a transition, which is when you take over and, and the mission changes. Tell us a little bit about how all of that came about. Well, uh, my interest really from the beginning had been musical theater. But I, uh, and I would, I would say every once in a while to Janet, 
I think maybe we should do only musicals. And I remember she would say, I know that, dear. <laughs> but I think, you, I think we should just keep doing what we're doing. <laughs> uh, but as, when we moved down here, the, the uh, uh, musicals were getting a lot more attention than the straight plays. And, and, and that had been the feeling for a while. For whatever reason, I thought it had potential of giving us a niche in the marketplace that we didn't have. And um, so I suggested it, and Janet agreed to do one season of only musicals. Mm -hmm. And um, she had been diagnosed with cancer two years before. Uh, that year of the anniversary. Yeah, the year, yeah. And um, uh, she said, no, let's try it. I think it's a good idea, let's try it. And um, she died in that year. I don't think it was caused by that. <laughs> uh, uh, <clears throat> Doug Cohen, who's one of, one of the shows that year was by Doug Cohen, he said to me the next year, do you, do you realize the significance of uh, the, sh the shows that you did last year when Janet died? I said, no, what are you talking about? He said, she took a turn for the worse during his show, which was called No Way to Treat a Lady. <laughs> She died during rehearsals for the next show, which was Gretchen Cryer and Nancy Ford's uh, The Last Sweet Days. <laughs> and the next show was a review with Tom Jones and Harvey Schmidt called The Show Goes On. <laughs> and when you think of oh, those, it's ironic. kind of, <laughs> hairs go up. Or and so when did, when, when did you approach the board? At that time, there was a, an active board here what, and say, hey, let's. Oh, uh, we, uh, David McCoy and I, da David and I later realized we were really dumb. We didn't know what we were doing at all. I had never planned on running a theater company. Janet had asked me and David to continue it if anything ever happened to her. To he, would he remain as chairman? Would I take it over as artistic director? And uh, so we did. We did. And. Uh, um, I just lost my train of thought. Talking about uh, becoming musicals and, and how it came to happen to gel. Yeah. The board uh, or making a, an official Oh, yeah. Decision. So we, oh, so I, I said, David, I think we should make it official that we go to do only musicals. And he said, if that's what you want, that's what we'll do. And we had no idea what we were doing. And, but we, the good thing, we never made an announcement. We never said, from now on, this is what we're doing. We just started doing only musicals, the 19... 97, 98 mm -hmm. season, I think mm -hmm. that's what. And uh, word, it just became obvious that's what we were doing. And most people today don't realize we ever did anything but that. But if you look at the wall out there, there's significant numbers. You hear this history, there's significant number of straight plays. And I have nothing at all against straight plays. It's just, uh, I, I, I thought it gave us a, a, a visibility that we didn't have. And uh, clearly, I think it's done good stuff for us, uh, the reputation we've gotten and the various things. So uh, we, I don't know that we ever went to the board and said. Actually, there was a couple of months while the board was fighting. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. And did I not know about that? I think you knew perfectly well about that. <laughs> <laughs> I just put it out of my mind. But, but, it, but fortunately, Selected you and David and I said, okay, if we have to toss the board, we'll toss the board. But this is going to happen. Molly has been a stalwart <laughs> supporter of the company and of me. Uh, but she just believes in what we do. And, and, um, and she's the kind of board member you pray for. And... Happily, we have a board made up of many of those people. David McCoy is another yes. who just, uh, you don't have to fight. You say, I think this is what we should do. And um, they understand the, the limitations under which we work. There's not a lot of funding, so we, we sometimes have to make end runs or something to, to make shows happen. But the fact that we've kept going uh, is is testament to everyone's work making it happen. When did some of the other programs start, like the Mufti? I mean, obviously well, you, you, go ahead. We, we should yeah. acknowledge that in terms of the transition from an eclectic uh, uh, programming to, um, to, to musical, strictly musical theater, uh, you had laid groundwork with musicals and Mufti, 
a series that uh, celebrates, uh, re rediscovers and celebrates lost treasures. Of musical theater. And, and that was 1994. Spring of 1994. It was 1992. Okay. It happened to be the same year that Encore started. Totally <laughs> unwittingly. We didn't know about them. And Janet and Charlie and I met in their dining room at, on 96th Street. And she said, I have this idea about doing concert versions of shows that we really can't afford to do full productions of. And, and we loved it. And uh, then there was a discussion of the title. And Charlie came up with the title because he'd been in the Navy. Mm -hmm. And the word Mufti spoke to him. I, I don't know that I'd ever heard it before. But, uh, I have a little trouble picturing Charlie in the Navy. What? I have a little trouble picturing Charlie in the Navy. <laughs> yeah, he played the organ on the ship. <laughs> <laughs> of course he did. <laughs> um, yeah, and, uh, but it, we, I think we've done more to uh, popularize that word or to make that word mm -hmm. known mm -hmm. than anyone in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, Anyway, so that's how that happens. So I mean, and, I mean, that, I think one of the fascinating things is how the different programs here at the York took off in terms of developing new musicals, how you support new authors, new writers, how you look towards developing new shows. Talk a little bit about that because that obviously is something that really happened under your regime uh, as you made the move and as you made the decision to support musicals here, right? Well, one of my ideas was, uh, my initial idea was the m main stage series of fully produced shows would be, would be all new works. And uh, I thought that set us apart from other people, like Goodspeed. And I'd worked a number of times at Goodspeed, loved working there, it was a great experience. But their emphasis at that time was much more on older shows, so I thought this would set us apart. Over the years, um, I realized that was uh, not, that there are wonderful old shows and that you can bring back shows that have been forgotten and do them in our main stage series and do the same, that, uh, uh, essentially create a new show because no one knows it. Like Enter Laughing. Well, just say, use Enter example. Laughing as a great example of how that grew from. The Mufti, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. It was a show that had bombed on Broadway and that we brought it back and proved it, it really worked. Uh, we'll talk about and so it. And it tied in totally to what we had done earlier with shows like Pacific Overtures and Lost in the Stars, uh, shows that, that uh, are not seen that often. So, so I'm now totally comfortable doing shows from the past in the mainstay show if they are sort of be re being rediscovered or re giving us, ch it gives us a chance to relook at them. Mm -hmm. um, well, I mean, as an example, I mean, because I think it is interesting, use interlapping as an example, and how, you know, Joe Stein, you brought it, how did it even come about to do as a Mufti? We were doing a Mufti series of Joe's work. We were doing the second Mufti series of Joe's work, mo three more shows the next year. And I said, well, Joe, what's left that we haven't done uh, other than the big, ones that we don't need to do. And he said, well, there's Andrew La No, it, so it was called So Long 174th Street. He said, well, there's So Long 174th Street. Uh, I don't know if it works, but if you want to try it, you can. So I read it and I thought, hmm, uh, well, it needs a good director. And I thought of Stuart Ross, who's brilliant comedically, and introduced Joe and Stuart and uh, they went to work on the script. They had like two weeks before the Mufti to, to turn the script around. And it wasn't ripped apart. It was just telling the story more clearly. And they were both masters at that. And out of that came a wonderful Mufti show that just took off incredibly. We did it again in the Muftis. And then we did it twice as a full production. And then we've just done it again last year uh, to kick off our 50th season. And it, it just plays incredibly. Any of you who saw it, uh, I think we'll agree. You'd better have been. <laughs> now, it's well, hilariously funny. <coughs> now, about some of the, what about some of the younger composers you I mean, that have come through the York as well? Some of the younger creators. I mean, Aaron Simplarity and, and Mark Sonnenblick and folks like that, how they come to the York. Um, uh, various different ways. Very, I mean, Aaron Simplarity were not discovered by us. We. We, but we did something with them, Lucky Stiff, mm -hmm. in the Mufti series that had had a very nice run off Broadway, a full production, uh, got a recording of all things. 10 years later, we did it in the Muftis, and they just went to town 
it was even some of the original cast, but they sort of approached it in a new way and it gave them a chance to work on the material. And out of that came a show that just played like gangbusters and a new recording. Who would have thought 10 years later that a new recording would happen of that show? It was because they had found stuff in the material to emphasize that they didn't realize was there the first time. And they were so excited by this simple little production. Graziella Danielle directed it. And it's probably one of the simplest Mufti's we ever did. Everyone was at music stands except the guy in the wheelchair who had to be in the wheelchair. And um, uh, she said, yeah, I believe in keeping it simple. I, I don't think actors should have to worry about where they're standing or where they're going. I just want them to concentrate on what they're saying and singing. And it turned out wonderfully. So there are all sorts of people we worked with for the first time. You mentioned Mark Sonnenblick, who wrote um, Midnight at the Never Get that we did last year. Uh, and it got a lot of attention. I, there's still talk of a commercial production of it happening. I would hope it would. Mm -hmm. um, um, I'm sorry, I'm blanking. No, for like Desperate it. Measures. And, and oh, Desperate Measures, Peter Kellogg and uh, <laughs> no. David yeah, Friedman. Friedman. Yes. A uh, wonderful show, wonderful writers. And we had a wonderful time with that. It moved to commercial production. Mm -hmm. Cagney, right. uh, which also moved. Anyway, um, we love, <coughs> all of us have talked about what Janet did for us, what Janet, uh, the, the leg up that she gave us in this business that is so difficult. And we have tried to keep that going. It, she did it for me, she did it for all of us up here, and hundreds of other people. And she just believed that she knew, as you said, Robin, what she went through as an actor, getting going, getting noticed, uh, that you need someone to say, here, you can, let me help you with that. Let me introduce you to this person. If you can do that for someone, whether they're a writer or a, a, an actor or a director, um, it can make a major difference in someone's career. Well, and kind of beginning to wrap this up a little bit, I think that one of the things that a lot of people don't realize, and to your credit, Jim, and to uh, the folks who really make these things happen here, a lot of people don't realize that here at the York, you have the main stage productions, you have the Mufti series that everybody knows. Those are the two things that people mostly know. But then our college and high school training program, which has been taking off over the last few years, which we just had the college training program just this past weekend, where we had 13 kids from as far away as Japan and Mexico City to New York came for two weeks of, ex of immersive training here. Uh, readings all year round of new works that in various stages of either as first stage around the table <coughs> to you know putting us on his feet the NEO program, which is the really the program to develop young artists, or not well, the age having nothing to do with it, but uh, artists who have uh, some things that perhaps they would not normally get out there, plus the long style relationships with people like Sheldon Harnick and, and Cryer and Ford and Maltby and Shire and Stephen Sondheim and so forth. And I think part of the genius of the York, and I, I go back to you know what I initially said, which is produces, celebrates, and discovers, is that the York really is truly lives up to its title of where musicals come to life in every aspect of what that means. And so what I'd like to do is to go around the circle real quick and end, ending with you, Jim, is just in a couple of words, you know, what the York, I don't want to get into this, the sapic, you know, what, what does the York mean to you, but, but what words, you know, when you think of the York, and then Jim, as you're looking at the last, or not the last, the next 50 years, the next 50 years, we've been looking at the last 50 years, but let, you know, what your challenges are and what you think of as we move forward into truly the next 50 years. Robin. The York, York means so much to me because of course it's connected to my dad, who uh, passed away in 2012. But it was also my entree into New York theater. I, I was a kid right out of school. I had done a little repertory theater, a little regional theater, and I came here and had a connection through my dad and started doing shows here. And it was a wonderful way to get seen in New York and uh, to do some stuff that I wouldn't have gotten a chance to do anywhere else. What I loved about New York is I had, uh, I, my paying job was at the Spence School. And so I was used to nurturing, watching kids, 
help them grow, help them to develop, and to realize that this was a theater doing exactly the same thing made me say, yes, I will work my little fingers off for that theater because it's nurturing, it's developing, it's helping people become what they need to become. I loved it because it was, uh, I didn't realize there was so much family, not actual family, except for John and my daughter being in, uh, that theater could be a sense of family. I had always heard more about theater. I majored in drama in college and was going to go into it not as an actress. Um, I never would have expected to find such love and such warmth and such imagination and such talent in a, in, a, in a situation as small as we were. It was just an amazing experience. Well, I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't have had it, you know, York gave me the chance to do amazing, amazing productions. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I owe everything to it. It uh, would not be, I would not have gotten anywhere. And uh, uh, so it was wonderful. Um, and at, as, as they say, in, uh, as Surratt says, at the end of uh, Sunday in the Park with George, so many possibilities. Uh, one of the people that I've interviewed for, the, for this project is um, Christopher S uh, Smith, the son of Sally Smith, who, whose name has come up frequently. Um, uh, Sally was uh, one of the, was um, a, a very practical part of the uh, York operation. She built sets and uh, carried things and uh, did all the, the backstage stuff that has to be done. Um, and um, uh, we've talked a lot today about how um, the financing was uh, 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 carried off, uh, the difficulty that Janet uh, has had and that Jim has had over the years in, in uh, keeping the theater going. Um, Chris, uh, Chris Smith, who's known as Cricket, um, uh, had the opportunity, he grew, he said, I grew up in that theater, um, and it was, uh, my, my, my mother used it as a babysitting service <laughs> as well. Uh, he had every chance to see the um, nuts and bolts of it, but what he said was, it was magic. It was magic. There was just magic about it. And I think when we sit in the auditorium and look at the stage, it, theater can seem like magic. Backstage, it usually seems like hard work. But um, the, the, there was always something, apparently, about the uh, chemistry of the personalities at the York that made it magic. Just as, as Mary Jo Donledger said, we all did it out of love, love for the theater and love for Jen. I don't know, you know that difference between tech and opening night, I think that is what <laughs> <laughs> Especially when Jimmy was still doing the floors. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Brendan, <laughs> that has not changed. <laughs> uh, I, I think of two Fire words of, as opportunity and support. Uh, I, the first show I did was David Story's Home that I mentioned. And just before tech, I had to fire an actor from the show and had to then recast and put someone else in and uh, with the thought going through my head that, well, this is the last time I'll work here <laughs> uh, because I thought the show would not make it and be what it was, we wanted it to be. The show turned out fine uh, and Janet and the theater support was there after the opportunity and I went on to do six more shows over the years. So. Uh, it's been that kind of a place that where you can go through what uh, the traumas of theater and have knowledge that there is still the the support to get you through that to the next thing. So uh, always grateful. 
Yeah, I think, um, I, I mean, sort of that theme of family is really something that uh, I think resonates. I mean, it, it's, in, it's in the theater community. I mean, we've you know, always said that it's a very small community and you, you, you almost never say goodbye. You're gonna work with somebody else in another six weeks or another six years. Um, and uh, Janet certainly gave me the opportunity to, 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 to like be a part of theater history. I, I was able to work with people like Stephen Sondheim and Burton Lane and Comden and Green and uh, uh, Cy Coleman, whether you like me or not. Um, and, um, and, and yet you still have people that are coming back that are part of the family to continue to make theater history now. And it's, it's nice to see that, it, that it's been able to, to move on because it, it almost didn't feel like that when I came. It felt like a tiny little theater that might just go away, but I think that there's uh, um, uh, a lot of love that's kept it, kept it going. Um, what did you want me to talk about? <laughs> <laughs> well, your thoughts along the same way, and then also your thoughts in terms of the challenges of moving forward, oh. the positives um, of moving forward. Well, it, it's been an incredible home for me, and uh, uh, which never was my intent when uh, all those years ago I started painting scenery backstage. and. Um, it just evolved, and I obviously love it, um, and it's done wonderful things for me. I think it gave me, uh, it made me whatever I am today. In terms of the future, I, um, well, someone else will at some point take it over and make it, uh, hopefully continue it. While we changed it, from the specifics of what was going on uh, before <coughs> I was running it, the heart of what it was is still there. And the music behind it all is still there. I, um, I think we have done everything we can to keep the family feeling. Uh, I, people talk about that all the time in the lobby. I come off the elevator and I just feel like I'm home. And that's a wonderful thing. There's a warmth that we try. and we try to project, and we talk to new staff members about it, about how we talk to audience members and how we feel about audience members. And we like people to say, we like it when people say that they feel different here than they are at other uh, institutions. They feel appreciated. Um, so I would hope for the future that, A, that we survive, and given that we've made it to 50, good. Why couldn't we make it to 100? Why couldn't they, whoever they are, make it to 100? And I, think, I think it's not about, for me, it has never been about, I love this space. I think there's so much about this space that is wonderful. Would it be wonderful to have a bigger space somewhere? Yeah, I'm not about getting bigger and bigger. I'm about selling all the seats we can here on a regular basis. Um, and and uh, doing work that we are always proud of, and I and I, I feel that we have. So if if the York, whoever is running it, can continue doing that in whatever form, do work that everyone is proud of, and that people love to come and see, and that people love to come to the theater, uh, then I think that's the York, and the York is continuing, and Janet is continuing, and we all of our work is continuing. It's the legacy and the continuity. Charles, you want to wrap us up? Um, <laughs> I, I, I don't know that I can say anything well, to top that. Well, we thank you all so much, and we are having a refreshments outside of the lobby afterwards because we are at home. Thank you all so much for being here.